and welcome to Studio One here at Brass Pass HQ for a brand new show, New Dimensions in Brass, which looks at all aspects of banding from every corner of the globe, from latest news and events to new repertoire and instruments and everything in between, with a host of high-profile international guests. There are four shows planned for this year, and these will be filmed at different locations around the banding world. We can't wait. We're extremely grateful to our sponsors for this show. Yamaha, Hal Leonard, Brass Bands England, and Centre Stage for their continued support. Thank you very much, guys. Let's have a look at what we've got in today's show. We chat to Brass Bands England Chief Executive Officer Kenny Cruxton about the 2022 European Championships. The JSVB Legacy, a new series of recordings and sheet music inspired by the legendary James Shepard versatile brass with an all-star cast. We also talk to the man himself, the one and only Jim Shepard. The amazing new guy on the composing block Frederick Skelderup and his rocket-paced rise in composition. Percussionist extraordinaire Simone Ribello pays us a visit with the first of her regular tutorials and masterclasses. The World Music Contest in Kakrada has its delayed return in 2022. We chat to Yappy Dijkstra about the brass side of the festival. The charismatic leader of Ikanga Bjorsvik band Vigo Bjorga joins us from Norway to explain the business model and administration of one of the world's best bands. Our next item is unmissable for bands all around Europe. Edward Gregson gives us a unique insight into the world rejoicing, the test piece for five major competitions in the coming year. And finally, we chat to Black Dykes, Nick Childs about their number one CD and the band's plans for the rest of the year. The European Brass Band Association recently made what was a surprise announcement to many people that the 2022 European Championships would make a return in England and would be managed by Brass Bands England. We interviewed EBA president Ulf Rosenberg recently and you can see the interview in full on our YouTube channel and on our Brass Pass TV platform. We caught up with Brass Bands England CEO Kenny Cruxton at a recent Brass Foundations live streamed event and began by asking him, was he surprised to get the call from Eber? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have said it was quite frantic, but it was certainly, it was certainly a surprising call. Um, it was about a week before Christmas, actually. It's a nice wee Christmas present for us there. So, having been given the set the challenge, I suppose, we went and had a, had a bit of a chat about it in the team and uh, yeah we've decided to take it on so it's going to be it's going to be quite exciting for the next uh, year. Why do you think given the fact that previous host countries and I'm talking about Palanga in this instance why do you think they weren't offered after putting so much preparation into the Europeans having a team and a venue and everything else ready to go and then seemingly overlooked and then subsequently given the 2024 championships? Yeah, I think I think we've got, all got to have a lot of sympathy for Palanga. I mean, if, if you think about it, originally they were meant to be doing 2019, and they got moved to Montreal mm -hmm. for for various reasons to do with the venue, and and then of course um, 2020 was cancelled because because of COVID. So so the the, the, the Lithuanians have had, a, have had a real hard time over this. I can understand, you know, I haven't haven't had explained to me by by Ulf Rosenberg at EBA. Um, I can understand EBA's thinking towards taking it to you know a well-established brass band country as they say it in, in the cradle of the brass band movement as, as they call it but um, no I really do feel a lot of sympathy for Palanga but I'm delighted that they've been given 2024 now and I'm sure you know I've never been there it looks like a fantastic place and uh, we're, we're all looking forward to going there. Okay so as we said earlier 15 months to organize this event where other countries get three to four years. Mm -hmm. BBE over the last three to four, five years, has grown massively and your workload is huge. Yeah, I think sometimes you've just got to be pre uh, prepared to turn up the volume a bit um, and, and apply yourself a bit more. But you've got to remember, uh, we've got a fantastic professional team who take care of the, you know, the, the business plan that we have with the Arts Council. Um, you know, we've got a lot of uh, 
key performance indicators on that that need to be met, and we'll, we'll continue to do that. Uh, Nigel Stevens, uh, who's well well known to many as the, the band manager of Friary Band, he's he's the project manager for the European Championships. So uh, him and I are, are working very closely together on that, and, and Mike Kilroy um, and Marie Bedford as well. We're all involved in it very closely. Okay, how are you financing the Europeans? Um, how much of a risk is it? Well, I think since the last time the European was in Birmingham, and it was 2007, I th that was probably the year, um, thinking back to it, where it all really started to kick off and become a bit exciting. That's when the, the, the Own Choice contest started to become that great festival, that great um, Saturday afternoon um, when everybody would kind of get excited about listening to brand new pieces getting played. And European Championships in Britain actually traditionally have been quite a difficult sell but really over the last 15 years or 13, 14 years or so it's been almost an instant sellout and as soon as the tickets have gone on sale they've been, they've been sold out mm. on and the when day. are the tickets going on sale? Um, we're hoping to get them on sale a bit uh, earlier than usual Sure, what's the capacity for Symphony Hall? It's uh, 2,000 it's, it's a lovely big hall as anybody who's been mm. to the British Open mm. will tell you mm. it's a fantastic place for a band contest um, we were in Symphony Hall about a month ago. Um, the foyer area is completely unrecognisable from, from what it was before. Um, and it's now got some fantastic performance spaces in it. Social areas like you, you just couldn't imagine compared with what it was before. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really hopeful that this is going to be uh, you know, the most exciting European Championships ever. I mean, everybody knows Symphony Hall. It's one of the best concert halls in Europe. And great to hear about the work and the uh, immediate vicinity. However, once you step outside there, <laughs> Birmingham's a disaster zone. How are you going to cope with a city which is under renewal? How do you attract visitors and make Birmingham appealing? Well, I mean, there's certain <laughs> things that are just completely out of our control, and you've, you've mentioned a lot of them there. I mean, we'll be making special arrangements for bands leaving the park in their coaches and things like that. The hotels in the vicinity are, there's plenty of great hotels nearby, so they're all, all within walking distance. So we don't see these as, as particular challenges. You know, a, a lot of the, the uh, timetable has been dictated by the availability of mm. the hall because mm. there's, a, there's an event on there on the, the Friday evening. So we're we are doing the Friday evening event in Birmingham Town Hall. I think any event should, should always be turning up the volume towards the very end. Correct. So the last thing you're going to get at our event is the announcement of the results. Yes. There'll be a fanfare and a national anthem or something to go with. Then a big party in the foyer. We've, we've got something absolutely sensational lined up for that as well. But start off with the youth competition. Um, the two youth competitions on the Saturday, then we're into the, the championship test piece. Um, and then on the Sunday morning, we'll do the challenge section. Championship own choice on the Sunday afternoon, gala concert on the Sunday evening. Well, the, the other controversial thing about your timetable, of course, is you've not included a European youth band. Is the European youth band now a thing of the past and is it relevant? That's a good question. I, I, you know, my, my own personal view could be run along different lines um, and I'm sure there's, there's a wide discussion going to take place within EBA and the, the delegates in Europe to, um, to look at the future of the band um, and, and how, how it's brought together on an annual basis purely for one week then it disbands and then a new one starts to fall in. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a question of legacy there um, and, and you know standing on shoulders of giants and all that so, mm. you know, but there are, there are issues with that but um, I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a different way to do it that would that would you know perhaps um, a wee bit less democratic let's say might um, be one way to do it but ensuring that you're getting the best young players in Europe in there um, and creating opportunities for what would really be a fantastic band this year, there were, you know, for, for 2022, there's, there's real challenges that we just thought we were unable to take on in terms of the risk that putting on the European Youth Band would have posed to us. So there's, there's, a, there's quite a financial burden there. Mm. Um, and to be able to do that and, you know, get through the weekend without losing a lot of money would have been irresponsible. Um, you've got to remember Brass Bands England is, is you know, we are, we are our members. So we're looking after our members' interests. Mm. We'll, um, we'll, hope that we'll, we'll hope we'll make a pound on the weekend rather than losing one, you know. Um, but I can guarantee if the, if the European Youth Band had been on, we would have lost a lot of money on the weekend. Mm. And that, that was just a risk we were just not prepared to take with our, with our members' best interests at heart. 
Um, so we had some uh, discussions with the European Brass Band Association about this, um, very detailed discussions over a long period, um, and agreed that if it is going to be on, and I believe there is a, still a chance that it will take place, but it will be organised by EBA, and, and we'll just find, have to find a way of fitting it into the, the timetable so somehow. So BBE aren't actively going to organise any youth band, aren't actively going to finance any youth band, no. and if it happens at all, that's going to come from EBA finances? Well, that's, that's a matter for EBA, isn't it? Because you know. they don't have any. Well, I'm sure they've got some, but I, I believe that there's, a, there's, there's um, discussions about a, a, a COVID relief fund that they're, they're working with. Right, OK. Um, okay. So if, if there's special money coming in for that and they want to use it for that, then, then that's absolutely fine with us, you know. But, but it, for, for the point of view of BBE, though, it was just a risk, especially at the current time when you know, there's so much uncertainty about travel. Sure, um, sure. You know, but, and, and but the this is Kenny. The different uh, paces that change in different countries as well it just, just makes it just too hard for us to take. I on. understand this, but does this set a precedent for future host venues? If we're going to turn around and say, well, we don't want the European Youth Band either. We don't want that burden. You're allowed the yeah, UK to get away with it. So we're now putting it on the table as a stipulation also, ever. That you have to we remember, don't want the though, band. that we are, we are doing it over 15 months. Well, I, I you know. know but, everybody but, everybody but, else has got a bit more time than that. Well, to, but that's EBA's decision, though, it. isn't it? That is EBA's decision to yeah. hand you the championships with that lifeline, but, or with that timeline, I should say. And if that precedent has been set that the host nation does not have to fund a European youth band, is that precedent then going to be thrown back at EBA in the future I, by host cities saying, we don't want that burden either? Go ahead, Ebba, you organise no, that. I think what, what Ebba will rightly say about this is that for quite a lot of countries in Europe, the, the European Youth, Youth Band can actually in itself be a, a source of funding. Um, it was never going to be so easy for us mm. in that particular mm. um, manner, but um, it can be a useful source of funding for, for other countries. So I'd, I'm not so sure that you'll actually get much resistance from, from a lot of countries in that one whatsoever. And, uh, no, I think yeah, but Eba, I've, I've thought this one through fairly well. I think, and uh, if, if you know, if they want to take on the you know the responsibility of putting the band on that weekend, we'll work as hard as we can with them to, to accommodate um, at various points in the weekend, and 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 it's, it it can be a, a very useful addition to to the weekend. Kenny, thanks for your time today. Thanks for joining us here on New Dimensions in Brass. It's been, as always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Martin. Of course, we all wish Kenny and the team at BBE the absolute best of luck with next year's event. James Shepard Versatile Brass was not only the best 10-piece brass ensemble we have known, they were groundbreaking in their time in taking brass music to a new level of entertainment and popularity and setting the absolute benchmark for playing standards. With the kind permission of James Shepard, Brass Pass TV has undertaken a mammoth recording and publishing project of over 100 previously unpublished and brand new arrangements that will soon be available for audio download with the sheet music in both brass and wind ensemble format distributed worldwide by our friends at Hal Leonard. The JSVB Legacy Band was crammed with all stars from the brass world. Richard Marshall, Tom Hutchinson, Mark Harrison, Steph Wilkins, Johnny Bates, Gary Curtin, Brett Baker, Adam Reed and Gav Sainer form the backbone of the brass, whilst Mark Landon, Anthony Mann, A.D. Smith and a small cameo appearance from myself gave an incredible percussion lineup, all superbly conducted by David Thornton. Here's how the project developed. That's the tap on the road. That's, uh, it seems such a long time ago since we started uh, in earnest with the Brass Pass Recital series and I think what happened is that we um, looked at putting on the last 
um, session that we did, a six-piece ensemble. And uh, even that probably came from talking about different collaborations that we should work on. And um, we're looking ahead and thinking about what's going to happen in terms of band starting back. And then I think we started talking about ten piece. And then for some reason we talked about James Shepard versatile brass because it's the, the sort of icon when it comes to ensemble music and uh, the the uh, legacy that, that that leaves. And uh, before we knew it, um, we're churning through 107 different pieces of <laughs> James Shepard versatile brass. So I looked at people that would work really well together uh, and that would gel together. So not people just because of their playing prowess and experience, but also would they fit within the group. And uh, I mean, I, I would say this, wouldn't I, because I sort of handpicked the group, but I think they worked extremely well together. <laughs> group all gelled massively well I mean they just get on very well socially um, and not just the people that were here day in day out but also the people that were brought in so for instance yesterday we had four percussionists <laughs> My memories of JSVB in the prime, well, for a start, Jim Shepard is my favourite cornet player. And I was really, really lucky, about 20 years ago, I actually played with Jim Shepard versus Style Brass. I sat next to Jim and played, so a great honour for me. You know, and to be doing this project is just fantastic. It's been a great way to get back into playing after lockdowns and everything. And a great focus for us musicians, but, um, oh, they were a great group, fantastic group, great camaraderie, and uh, the playing was awesome as well. Yeah, no, uh, some of Kevin's arrangements have been really, really good fun. Uh, the fact that Kevin was in, you know, Versatile Brass in the first place. And one of my old music teachers, Derek Southcott, uh, was also part of it. And he went on to the Sid Lawrence Orchestra, so there's all that big jazz, big band connection with the JSVB. And it's been really, really good fun to get to grips with all of these arrangements and the different styles, you know, when everyone's playing cornet and flugel and everything, to then switch it up to have absolutely full big band uh, sounds and accents and driving force. It's just a completely uh, different side of things. It's been really good fun to get together. a lot of people who knew JSVB will have known quite a lot of these old school big band charts but uh, Kevin's arranged a lot of modern ones uh, from uh, Gordon Goodwin and his big fat band and so a lot of people might know, know some of these modern arrangements and to do it in this setting and this style with these group of players has been really really fun stuff. For a whole year we've kind of put our instruments away briefly, taken them out again and then had false starts and it's been difficult to, to get back in the habit to be perfectly honest. Um, but to be booked for this, I think it was maybe before Christmas, quite a bit before Christmas. And then hearing the names in the group as well, not only am I getting to play with fantastic players from our movement but also good friends that I've met over the years and played in bands with. So it's, it's been fantastic and to have uh, Dave Thornton conducting as well is absolutely just brilliant, it's a fantastic group. It's been a pleasure to, to be involved in this, this project. Um, there's been some, uh, some great new music written for the, for the ensemble uh, and some fantastic kit parts um, from uh, jazz and Latin stuff um, to sort of rocky pop, pop music, uh, some ballads, um, a real nice mix of styles um, and some real challenges for, um, for the drum kit. It's
it's been fantastic um, and uh, I, I think I've, I felt a certain amount of responsibility as well not just because um, of, of the JSVB legacy and the significance of that but you know to stand in front of a group of like this with this many quality players in one room um, you know you've got to do a good job <laughs> I think the the trick to conducting, I think the trick, um, uh, I'm not always entirely sure, but uh, is knowing when to get out of the way. And of course, with a group like this, it's very, very important. And with some of the jazz stuff, that is exactly, I mean, with, with Mark Landon on kit and Mark Harrison leading the uh, the kind of big band trumpet line in, in those arrangements, um, you know, they're kind of looking after themselves and it's, it's I had the best seat in the house. But, uh, but with the quality of playing, the quality of uh, repertoire, the quality of the, uh, the production and the package, you put all that together and I think it, it, it is very significant and it's, it's a fantastic way to really celebrate what a fantastic group that the James Shepherd vs. Douglas was. Brilliant stuff from everyone involved. All that was then needed was the seal of approval from the man himself, Jim Shepherd. He made the short journey from his home a couple of miles away and it was a real pleasure to spend some time in his company. Jim, welcome to the show, first of Thank all. You. Great Thank to see you. Now, you've just been listening to some of the recordings from the JSVB Legacy Band. What's your honest opinion? Well, I'm very impressed, you know. I'm not surprised with that lineup, but uh, I am really impressed the way they, uh, they've got the idiom of the jazz feel right. And uh, yeah, generally just excellent. Well, you mentioned the lineup, and we can't go far wrong when you've got the likes of Richard Marshall and Tom Hutchinson and uh, Gary Curtin, Johnny Bates, Britt Baker, and the rest of the band. They were all absolutely terrific. But of course, all this was the JSVB legacy, so the James Shepherd versatile brass, which for the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s really was the groundbreaking. 10 piece group that we all came to know and love but just for the younger generation because we're all <laughs> getting on at that little bit now Jim tell us how the JSVB all started off well the idea came from Black Dyke actually we had an octet and uh, it comprised of uh, most of the soloists in the band Soliphonium, Principal Cornet uh, a couple of from the front row and solo horn and uh, I got the idea there, and I thought if we'd used the more difficult instruments like uh, piccolo trumpets, and uh, eventually Hickey got a mellophone. That's and, right. And uh, at first we used cornets, but uh, it didn't work, and uh, so we had to adapt to, to trumpets eventually. But uh, it was all trial and error at first, but. Uh, at the end, it, it, it worked out, you know. Well, didn't it just work yeah, out very, yeah, very yeah, well? Yeah. It's the, probably the most famous 10-piece ensemble in the world. So before you made the break from Black Dyke to form James Shepherd Versatile Brass, how many years had you been principal cornet at Black Dyke? I was in my ninth year. Ninth year. I did, actually, I did 10 years, 63 to 73, yeah. Which at that time was a, a huge commitment uh, for a band like Black Knight. You were under central contract, as I uh, as I understand. And so to make that breakaway, that that must have taken some doing, Jim. Yeah, it was uh, rather unfortunate. It was a bittersweet, as it happened. That uh, I uh, I was asked by Jeffrey Brand to to uh, perform the. Ernest Tomlin's Cornet Conjure. He said he was commissioning a work and he'd like me to do it. And, and I said, obviously, I'd like Dyke to accompany me. Mm. And uh, it went on for a number of months and, uh, and we, we, they couldn't decide because they didn't like doing mass band concerts. And, uh, it, and, uh, and, uh, and they said, that, well, they'd accompany me but not play in the mass bands. Mm. It mm. went on for a few months and... Uh, 
And during this period, yeah, I was burning the candle at both ends, and uh, I, I was really on a down, you know, I was having a near nervous breakdown, I think. And uh, it was, uh, so I decided I didn't want to do it. And I can remember the night Roy said, uh, Roy Newsom said, yeah, we must put this thing to bed. You know, we've got to decide tonight. And I stuck my hand up and said, Roy, I don't want to do it. And a couple of weeks later, I got a letter from Peter Wilson saying, you'd like VB ah, to okay. do that, that spot, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it put me in rather an awkward position. And, uh, and, and I think Roy and Peter Lambert, who was the chairman of the band, who was, you know, we, we, he, uh, they decided that uh, that uh, this wasn't on and uh, they gave ultimatums to, to players. And, right. Uh, and I resigned and uh, the other players, the other three, Colin Aspinall, David Horsfield and Harvey Whiteley, the percussion player, they decided uh, they give them the ultimatum, either play at the contest with Dyke or play with VB. Wow. And uh, that's that's how we came to leave. It's a bit bittersweet because uh, we went on to good things and obviously Philip McCann went, uh, Philip went and uh, was one of the best periods contesting that I've ever had. It know, was. So. It was, Jim. Well, as, and, uh, as, as they say, when one door closes, uh, another, another one opens. opens. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. what a door it was that opened. From, I think, the very first few concerts that JSVB did, you gained such a reputation. And I think that was probably threefold. If And tell me if I'm wrong on this, Jim. But the, I think the standard of the playing, the difference in the repertoire... And also that you put that element of entertainment into yeah, the, yeah. the concert. That it wasn't just 25 players sat around a stand playing old repertoire. It was something new. It was something different. It was groundbreaking. It was entertaining. And the audiences lapped it up and loved it. Yeah, we did. Well, we knew we were onto something good, you know, uh, from the first concert in Upper Mills Civic Hall. Mm. And, uh, you know... we. When we, the original team, we, we used a trumpet player called Pete Ferris, who was ex Joe Loss, yes. lead trumpet. Yes. And uh, he was great with the jazz, but uh, if he was accompanying delicate, <laughs> he's, he was like a laser beam coming through, you know. But he didn't last long, did Pete, but uh, he put some great ideas into our head. We did expand the repertoire a bit, and uh, but it was hard going at first because uh, we had no repertoire as mm. such. Mm. And, uh, and eventually it, it grew and grew, and then we got in touch. Uh, I worked for the West Riding of Yorkshire as a peripatetic brass teacher, and uh, I met a guy called Ray Woodfield who was ex-Marines, mm. and he, mm. he'd, he'd got demobbed and he'd come out of the army. And uh, I met Ray, and I, I just I remember asking him one day, I said, why don't you do some arrangements, come and conduct the group, and, and, and then use the, the group arrangements, expand them for full band, you know, eventually. Mm. And mm. what he did, we used them for a year, and then he would arrange them for full band, and, uh, and he expanded our repertoire enormously, you know. During this pandemic, I think now was the time when possibly it'd be good to have some repertoire for smaller groups. Where well, th this was the whole point of doing, the, of, of course, the JSVB legacy program, that there's yeah. 100 new arrangements, some old which haven't been published, but the majority new arrangements to fit into a 10-piece ensemble, both wind ensemble and brass, that... Bands that can't get together now as a full band That's right. can now get That's together right. as a yeah. ten piece, yeah. and yeah. I hope that it's going to be the catalyst for more and more ten piece playing because it was an absolute art. There's no hiding place in a no, ten piece, there isn't. and no, I think there isn't. I think Every it makes your general band either, yeah. playing that yeah. much better, yeah. Jim. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It, uh, you know, I used to love quartet playing, which is much, mm. much the same every part. Yeah, there's no hiding place. That's and, a forgotten uh, art as and, well. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, the great days quartetting, you know, and uh, yeah, but uh, I think there is a place for a 10 piece repertoire. Absolutely. Well, one of the pleasures I have as the proprietor of the British Bandsman 
as well as having Brass Pass TV, is that I get to choose an award, the Herbert Whiteley Award, every year. Now, mm -hmm. Herbert was a former editor of the British Bandsman, hugely influential in his time, and it became a tradition thereafter that every year, whoever was in charge of the British Bandsman would award the Herbert Whiteley Award to somebody who has put a lifelong commitment and an effort and an input and a contribution to our fantastic brass banding movement. And I'm delighted, absolutely delighted and honoured to say that this year's recipient of the Herbert Whiteley is none other than my guest today, Jim Shepherd, for a lifetime of wonderful work with brass bands, with JSVB. I can't count how many students have gone on after having uh, worked with yourself to great things. You're one of our characters, Jim. You're one of our legends. And I say that word uh, very advisedly because it gets overused so much. And in normal times, I would be delighted to pick the trophy up and shake you warmly by the hand. But as we have to remain a COVID distance, I, I just need to point at the trophy and say very, very well, deserved Jim and huge congratulations on being this year's winner. Well many thanks Martin, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to accept this award, this beautiful award and uh, I, I would like to thank you and, and your team for everything you've done, to, you've given the time to... Oh, our absolute pleasure, uh, our absolute know, pleasure to, Jim. To, so uh, I thank you very much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, the one and only Jim Shepherd. Legend is a word often overused, but not in connection with Jim. An absolute star in every respect, famously humble, and a very worthy recipient of the Herbert Whiteley Award. Join us after the break when we profile a rising star in composition circles, catch up with a percussion masterclass and preview the WMC 2022. See you in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. I first met our next guest when he was part of the amazing percussion section of Ikanga Bjorsvik band that conquered everything in its path. 
Since then, he's developed a reputation as one of the best up-and-coming composers in brass music today. Before we meet him, the Stavanger Band recently recorded a work of his, Felicitas. Commissioned by Yamaha for their band clinic program, let's have a listen. It is, of course, Frederick Skelderup, and we caught up with him through the magic of Zoom. Frederick, welcome to New Dimensions in Brass. We just heard your fantastic commissioned work by Yamaha. It's called Felicitas. Tell us a little bit about the work. Thank you, Martin. Um, Felicitas was uh, commissioned and uh, written last year, about this time we're now in, uh, in April. So it was a commission from um, Yamaha and uh, the conductor Erik Jansen, uh, which the, the commission came around a, a very difficult uh, period of time because it was the, during the lockdown sure. uh, last year. So 
it was quite uh, it was quite positive as a as a musician to to receive a commission just after the world uh, was in lockdown so this for me it was a very positive uh, positive uh, thing uh, to do so i felt like the stuff i'm going to write uh, in this period is is it like uh, going to be all corona stuff but i felt like uh, as the title say felicitous which is a positive word i i felt i had to use the the positive vibe now we we just heard we saw on screen as well just earlier russell gray who is conducting stavanger band now he says that this work is the perfect either concert opener or concert finisher now it's it's a rare thing to produce such a work that you can either have at the start of a concert or right at the end of it. Yeah, um, I think it was important because uh, it's a free download from uh, the Yamaha website. Yes. So it's important that the music is available in terms of uh, the technical skills, the register, uh, but also the musicality of it. It's important that it might fit every band uh, on every level. So. Um, I hope all bands out there, either brass bands or fanfare bands, will take a look at the piece and download it. It's free uh, at the Yamaha webpage. So. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Now, we've known each other for a few years now, and we first met when you were part of the incredible percussion section at Eikanger Bjorsvik at a time when they were sweeping past all the competition, winning everything in the world, hands down. What's your memories of those days? Oh, I played in the band for 10 years from 2007 <laughs> to 2017. So there's a lot of memories. Uh, but I think I think the biggest one is maybe uh, taking the uh, European title in uh, Ostanda in Belgium in 2017. That's that's the highest. Uh, yeah, we on the same show, we've been talking with uh, Vigo Bioga, uh, the uh, chairman and the, the band manager of Ikanga, and he was telling us about their relentless strive for musical detail and musical perfection. And that comes across in every performance I've listened to from Ikanga. Now, I know that you're not playing anymore these days because you're too busy conducting and you're too busy composing fantastic music. Tell us a little bit, first of all, about what you're doing conducting-wise. Um, at the moment, I'm conducting two, um, two brass bands for um, adults, and um, I'm conducting one school band. Wow. So it's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's quite a contrast, but I absolutely enjoy it. And it also opens up to for me to bring my own music or try stuff out with the bands. So it's, it's a great mix, both being a conductor and a composer. And... And the musicians also want to play my music as well. I'm not sure if you're aware, but your Festivus uh, piece was the first piece ever played on Brass Pass TV by the Whitburn oh. Band in our very first engagement. So congratulations uh, well, thank for you. that. Now, how did you make the transition from playing into composition? And uh, what was the first serious piece that you think you had composed for yourself? That's a tricky one because I, I've i always been playing in a, in my local school band called Ytterbygda Skolekorps. But uh, during the years in, in the band there, I started playing in, a, in a rock band. So one of my first really uh, real compositions was actually uh, pop rock songs for the band. <laughs> so that was actually my first songs. But uh, when I went to high school, I got in, in touch with some uh, some great teachers, uh, Andreas Lienre, former percussion player in the Eikanger band, and yes. Frode Rydland, uh, former soprano player in yeah. the Eikanger band. So I, I've always loved to create music and create stuff. So they helped me a bit with uh, arranging music. And um, suddenly I was I was actually taking percussion percussion classes, but um, some of my friends were just in a league above me uh, in uh, in playing percussion. So I suddenly started to write music and uh, Frode Rydlan and Andreas helped me on the way, uh, writing and arranging stuff. So mm -hmm. I think my first my first compositions were uh, were made at uh, at high school. And 
we had we had a small uh, group of uh, brass players as well so i got to try out the pieces fantastic now for uk viewers who are listening to this show they will remember ikanga coming over to brass in concert sweeping brass in concert away but you were one of the joint composers along with Red Gillia and Frodo Ridland for that Brass in Concert um, set, which I think was also played at Sidis as well. So that was, um, I just left the band uh, before the Brass in Concert. So uh, it was uh, it was amazing to, to be a part of the now composing and arranging uh, team in the band. Because uh, it's been for so many years that the Eikanger band has brought on uh, new works, new arrangements by uh, Reid Gillia, Frode Rydland, Svein Henrik Jeske, etc. So for me, it was an honor um, as a member or former member of the band, but now uh, be a part of the team who was writing for the band. And they had, they played really well, both in cities and in Brass and Concerts. So it was just, yeah. just an honor, really. Wonderful. Now, if you're going to have any mentors in writing for Brass Band, probably Frodo Ridland and Red Gillia uh, amongst two of the very best. But when I look through your parts and look through the scores of works that you've done, Frederick, what amazes me is not only the rhythms, but also the harmonies and the underneath parts that you write for band as well. Where do you get the influences other than Frodo and Raid in writing those works and who do you class as your mentors a lot of my music is inspired by both my uh, both my band background from the um, from the local school band and always been playing in a brass band but also in uh, in the music i listen to uh, and pick up rhythms uh, sounds etc so um, it's a big question uh, but one of uh, one of my favorite composers is uh, is Derek Bourgeois. Uh, ah. I think his his music is uh, he writes the beautiful melodies, but suddenly the music is in contrast very angry and hard. But the way he combines the two, uh, yeah, emotions. Mm. Yeah, I think he's a master, Frederick, at describing music. Yeah, and Philip will be as well. Um, I'm a, really mm-hmm. a master. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 the same way he he combines the contemporary with the traditional brass band sound in a just in an excellent way. Now you're already signed up with uh, a couple of publishing houses. Tell us um, who you signed up with and uh, how many works you've now got in the published arena, Frederick. My music is mainly published in. Um, in Norway with a Norwegian band music or in Norwegian uh, it's called Norsk Notesavis mm-hmm. and I have got some music as well in Belgium uh, at the BVT Music Bert Fantin Music Publisher. Mm-hmm. When are you going to write a major test piece work because I, I've got a feeling this is just around the corner with you. Well um, it's um, that's the that's my highest uh, achievement to write or to be able to to get a commission like that uh, of a test piece for the champion cha- championship uh, section. That's that's the that's the one I'm uh, I'm still uh, <laughs> still uh, looking forward to. So I hope one day. I hope one. Well, day. I I think at the rate that you are going and the standard of the work that you put out, Frederick. That is going to be one day very soon, I'm sure. Where do you see yourself as a composer in maybe 10 years' time? Do you think you'll still be combined or confined into the brass and wind band world, or do you want to spread out into the orchestral sphere as well? Hard to say. I've always had had a, had a foot in, in, the, in the brass band or in the band movement. Mm. So that's that's a big part of me, and I don't, don't think I would be without it or yeah. the, the orchestral world's loss is the brass band's gain with yourself i hope we're going to hear much much more from you in the near future frederick i'm sure we will thank you for all the work you've done so far and um, we really really look forward to hearing more works of yours in the coming years thank you so much the very best of luck to frederick and all his future plans from one percussionist to another. 
Simone Ribello has long been held in esteem as a world-renowned soloist and Yamaha artist, but it was in brass bands, notably Foden's, under the magnificent Howard Snell, that first brought her to the public eye. Since then, she has achieved so much and for several years now has been the head of percussion at the Royal Northern College of Music. With the ever-increasing use of percussion in today's brass band repertoire, organisation is key. Let's have a listen to Simone and see how she goes about this. Welcome back to the band room. It seems like a long time ago that we were here and all the percussion instruments have come back out of storage and it's time to get set up for our first rehearsal and maybe for our first concert as well. Now, of course, as percussionists, we have to have lots and lots of many different skills. We've got to play lots of different instruments. We've got to be able to move around our section. But the one thing that's really, really important for us is we've got to be super, super organised. How we set up our instruments is going to affect not just how we play but also the rest of our section as well. We can't do a setup that just suits us and then it means that our colleagues have to sort of clamber over something or trip over something on the way uh, from one instrument to the other. So it's just making sure that everything we do is set up perfectly because one another skill that we really have to have as well of course as percussionists is real teamwork skills too. So what we're going to talk about today is setting out our instruments, preparing for a concert or a contest maybe. First of all, for me, with setting out the instruments, I always like to set them out nearest to the instruments that they're going to be playing with. So in a standard brass band setup, if you like, for example, I like to have the timpani maybe a little more towards the trombones and the tubers, and I might need to have my mallet percussion maybe a little more towards the cornets and the higher end of the band, so that the instruments that I play with within the piece, I have my instruments near to that. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't work out quite as neatly as that, but that would be my basic layout to start off with. So let's say that we've got a brand new piece on our programme. Let's say it's a big piece of music. So how we set our instruments out is going to be pretty much predominantly for this particular piece. The first thing I think I would do is get around the table with my colleagues in the section with a piece of paper, with the parts, and go through the parts and figure out, first of all, the instruments that we are going to need for this particular piece. Now, most of the time these days, when you get a percussion part, there'll be a small kind of menu, if you like, at the top of it that tells you exactly what instruments you require for that particular piece. Now, that's not always the case, and anyway, it's a good idea to just look through the part, even if you've got your menu that you have of all the different instruments you need. You might, for example, need to look through and realise that apart for the suspended cymbal that you'd think well I would just be playing that with my suspended cymbal sticks actually needs to be played with brushes so you might want to add that onto your menu at the top of the part and once you've done it once you've always got it so every time you go back to that piece of music you can straight away see instantly the, the instruments and the mallets and the accessories, if you like, that you're going to need for that particular piece of music. So we've got our parts, we've got to decide who's going to play what, and it's always good, you know, to mix it up a little inappropriate times of course if we've got a big contest then if we've got someone that's really really passionate about playing the timpani and there's a big timpani part well we probably want to put that person on the timpani part but if there's a concert maybe for example that's not under such big pressure maybe there's a timpani part that's um, a little more of a straightforward part maybe somebody who's not quite so au fait with playing the timpani might want to give it a try i know for me the drum kit was always the thing that wasn't quite my area of expertise but for certain concerts when I was playing with Foden's I would love to go and play on the drum kit and it just gave me that confidence. So we've decided who's going to play what part, we're around the table, we've gone through the parts to, to figure out for example the sticks and the instruments that we need but also thinking about are there any quick changes, do we share instruments at all, maybe I play the tam-tam and Chris plays the tam-tam as well and that means that how we're going to set up means that we're going to have to set up pretty close to each other so that we're not having to run from one end of the stage to the other to get to the tam-tam. So things like that, it's all practicalities and it's very easy to do basically on a piece of paper so we don't have to even be in the rehearsal room or have the instruments around us to be able to do that. So we figure everything out on paper, who's going to play what, who's going to um, uh, move around between the instruments. Practicalities again, I've got to play 
the xylophone, and maybe I've got to play the glockenspiel. Do I want to take my piece of music from the xylophone while the piece is going on and move it over to the glockenspiel? Probably not. I never liked the idea of having a piece of music and sort of walking and reading at the same time, apart from anything else. You might trip over something on the way. So always see whether you need extra copies of the pieces. It looks a little bit neater in performance as well. So we've got everything on paper. We've decided how we're going to set everything up. Now we come into the band room where we set it up for real so that we can see exactly how it sets up and practically how it's going to work. And this is where something I always think is so important to do, and that's to do a percussion sectional. That's for the percussion section, just us, not with the band, to really be able to figure it out. Is this going to work? Can I use that tambourine? Or actually, is it going to be too much of a confusion to come over and get the tambourine and go back? Maybe actually what we need to do here is have two tambourines. Just things like that, and it's things that we can work out without the band being there. But also, I think it's quite nice to have a percussion section because we don't sit or stand shoulder to shoulder. So it's a little more tricky for us to be able to hear what each other's doing. And if you really want to slot together well as a team, then it's a good idea to have a sectional where you can really just sort of call across to each other. Somebody that's playing the timpani might be sitting a long way away from someone else who's playing on the other side of the band and just be able to see what we're doing and slot everything together. It's also great as well to have the conductor at the sectional. You know, we stand right at the back of the band and in the rehearsals, we've got everybody in front of us. So if the conductor wants to ask us a question, they have to sort of raise their voice over the top of the band. And for us to answer back, we have to raise our voice over the top of the band as well. And I like the idea of having the sectional where the conductor can come a little bit closer, can come here as well and sort of have a look and say, oh, you know, what about if we use a different stick on, on the xylophone or what happens if you make, maybe make a drier sound on the vibraphone? It just gives the conductor a chance to come and see what we're doing, try stuff out and be quite practical about it as well. So we, in our sectional, we're able to sort all of those uh, small details out, if you like, work together as a team as well. And then when the band comes, of course, there's going to be a few things that might need to be changed, but at least we've got a basis to go from. So we've decided everything is set out exactly as we want it. We've uh, marked up our parts. We know where all the moves are that need to happen. And when we're talking about then our concert programme and putting everything together, we need to make sure that we know actually between piece two and three, we need to do a complete reset. Hopefully not that many instruments moving, but maybe three instruments need to move. So again, we have to factor that into our organisation. We need to tell the conductor, actually between piece two and three, we're going to need a couple of minutes. So we might need a, a longer moment from the compare, for example, just to give us a chance to get everything set. So think about the practicalities, think about moving through your programme as you're going along and think about what it looks like as well. We've talked already there about not having the music sort of walking around. We want the audience to uh, watch us. Of course, they're going to be watching us because we are at the back. We're moving. You know, everybody's eye goes to the percussion because there's so many exciting instruments around. There's so many uh, a, a movement, if you like, as well, that everybody's eye will always go to the percussion. But we want to make it look slick and if we're walking past each other not crashing into each other if we're doing our quick changes as well makes for a very very exciting performance so the last thing i would say then is once you've got everything organized and, and set up is um, a one final practical tip with being organized and it's this whenever you're playing the snare drum always make sure that when you leave the drum you switch the snare off We've all had that awful moment of playing a really loud piece of music on the snare drum and then putting the sticks down and maybe sitting down because we're not in the next piece because it's slow and quiet and features the euphoniums. And as soon as it starts playing, the snare's rattling away and we, one of us has to gingerly get up and <laughs> switch the snares off. So the default position for your snare is always snares off. Our thanks to Simone, who's going to be a regular contributor to these shows. The World Music Contest in Kakrada is held every four years and should have taken place later this year, but due to COVID, this has now been moved to 2022. It is truly a world showcase for marching bands, but also has a month-long programme of indoor competition and concert performances from wind, concert and brass bands. 
My old friend Yappy Dykstra puts together the brass section of the festival and it was our pleasure to catch up with him through the magic of Zoom. And it's a big welcome to Yappy Dykstra joining us from the Netherlands. Yappy, good afternoon. And how long have you been associated with the WMC? Good afternoon, uh, Martin. Um, well, the WMC asked me in 2003 to do some work on the brass band weekend because they were not satisfied about the numbers of brass bands and the quality of the brass bands at that time. So they asked me to prepare for 2005. So that's uh, around that time they I was involved. You are steeped in brass bands from a young boy and what you don't know about brass bands isn't worth knowing about. So people have heard of the WMC, Yappy, but tell us in a little bit more detail exactly what the WMC is. Yeah, well, this is a, a, actually quite a long answer, but I will make it very short. <laughs> uh, uh, the festival in Kerkrade is going on for a complete month. There are four weekends, and in the weekends there are competitions for uh, wind bands, uh, percussion bands, fanfare bands, brass bands, and mainly in the stadium of the football club, there are also for uh, show bands. The social thing in Kerkrade is very important because uh, every street, every corner, there is live music. In the evening, there is a market where everybody goes, and this makes it very attractive for bands from abroad to come. And literally, Kakrada attracts hundreds of thousands of visitors from all around the world for this event. Uh, that's one of their main goals to make it a real intercontinental worldwide event. And uh, they try as much as possible to get bands from Asia, from Australia, New Zealand, uh, America. Uh, well, that's, that's actually one of the main things what they want to do. And even they want to involve Africa because Africa is actually the only continent which was not represented until now. Now, you mentioned Africa, Yappy, but there's a lot of discussion. And I know we've spoken about this previously, that there's the possibility of a contingent of African children coming across to the WMC under the banner of Brass for Africa. What can you tell us about that, Yappy? And what we want to do, actually, and that's all I can say about it, is to get uh, a young brass band from Africa, from Uganda, over here in Kerkrade, and they will do some joint uh, lessons, uh, band practices, and those kind of things, together with the World Youth Brass Band, which will be specially formed in, in 2022. Incredible. Now, as you said earlier, Yappy, you look after the brass band section of the, the WMC. Now, the event was delayed from 2021 because of COVID now into 2022. What can you tell us about the brass band competition for WMC 2022, the test pieces? And first of all, what dates in July next year will the weekend be held? It's the weekend of the 8th till the 10th of July uh, next year. And it will be on the Thursday night, a big opening show. And then on the Friday and Saturday, there are four sections in the WMC. Uh, we, we, we call it concert division for the elite section or the championship section. And this is only on invitation. 12 bands uh, have been receiving this week or the next week their invitation. And that's based on uh, some of their uh, national and international rankings. And the rest is open, but in total, uh, I think it was around 40 bands who can compete in total, but in the concert division, only 12, max. Okay, now we'll, we'll talk about the concert division in a moment, but for the open division, um, have bands already applied for WMC 2022 and are there still spaces available? Well, uh, officially, uh, the, the announcement of the test pieces and the format and the rules have been uh, done by the 1st of April and the bands can enter the competition between the 1st of June and the 1st of October. But I saw already in the mailbox of the WMC that quite a lot of bands have already been looking <laughs> and have already tried because you can't actually enter the competition this year just by giving a call to the office. The only thing is you have to do a complete 
uh, documentary, CV. Okay, so for the concert division, Yappy, is it going to be set test piece, then own choice on two separate days, on, or is it all condensed into one day, or...? It's on the Friday, it's, it, it will be the test piece for the concert division, and this is contest music. But then, yes, on Friday, there will be the test piece, and on Saturday will be a program, an own choice program. And you can, it's, it's about 40 minutes, 45 minutes in total for the uh, concert division, and they can play whatever they want. And most bands do one solo, or uh, they, you can play a march, you can do a, a, a light stuff, but there will be adjudicated on artistic value content. Yes. Okay, so nothing for entertainment value, just purely no. technical playing standards. Very much like Band of the Year and the Dutch Open, Yappy. Yeah, it is. And and what we appreciate very much also is that they have a very balanced program with also new commissioned music, for example, and the balancing in um, uh, the spread of the, the composers they are using, that it will not be only one country, but they have a good uh, a spread and, and a good balance in, in, in the pieces. The adjudicators will take in consideration the artistic build-up of this program. Okay. Now, the adjudicators for WMC on the Brass Band Weekend, Yappy, is it open adjudication or is it closed? Well, uh, it, like the previous time in 2017, the um, test piece will be closed and that will be on a draw on the same day. Yeah. The open, uh, the, the, the program will be open adjudication and the draw will be made uh, together with the solicitor in January 2022 already. Wow, okay. Now, what's the reasoning behind having one section as closed adjudication and one section as open? Well, we, we, we got a couple of times the request from the adjudicators and uh, also uh, from some of the bands if we have to bring an artistic program with soloists and you can't see what's going on. And if a band plays a, a, a special tune from the UK or Norway or Switzerland, it's so easy to find out which band it is. Is, it, is there any use to do it still close then? Mm. Test piece, oh. test piece we, we think yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I, I can understand that. Now we we talk uh, briefly about the test piece. That there's probably no finer test of a band than contest music. Was this your choice, Yappy? Uh, we have a music committee in uh, in Deventer, and they uh, do more competitions like our nationals. Uh, they select also the test pieces for our uh, nationals. And for Kerkrade, we did this, but we had a special. Uh, Consignment from uh, the WMC, they said uh, in 21, this year, it's 70 years ago that the first real festival was uh, held in Karkrade in wow. 1951. So there was a kind of uh, a, a special uh, feature on history. So we were asked together, the music committee, and I was there as well, and the, uh, Björn Bus, the artistic director of Karakarada, was there. We were asked for all wind band, fanfare band, and brass band to find pieces with a real historic value, and it's a real standard or classics in the brass band repertoire. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Now, tell us about the test pieces for the other sections of the competition, Yappy. Yeah, so contest music, uh, champ uh, championship section, first section is Tell Us Variations, uh, Philip Spark, second section, uh, Entertainment, Gilbert Finter, oh. and in the third section, we have a brand new composition, a commission, uh, by a Swiss, a young Swiss composer, Etienne Klausas, and he wrote Albinus Variations. Now, Anybody who's wanting to go to WMC next year, Yappy, what is your advice? Book early? I think like the last time, uh, the gala concert and the championships uh, section was sold out. So mm. it was really fantastic, a very good audience. And the hall, uh, since they rebuilt it in 2015, is so much better now. And the lower sections are in a separate hall, which is now also uh, renovated completely. And uh, the, the, the elite section will be in the... Uh, Rodahal in, in Karkrade. Yeah. yeah, perfect, perfect. Now, when do tickets go on sale, Yappy? 
Don't know yet. I think it will be the 1st of February, March next year. The, okay. I, I think they mostly say three months ahead. Before we let you go, Yappy, the next New Dimensions in Brass show is coming to your neck of the woods in Groningen yes. in Netherlands. Tell us a little bit about what we've got in store for everybody in June. Well, it's, it's, it's fantastic that we can do it now from Groningen, and I can tell you, uh, the municipality and our stakeholders here are very happy that we are going to do this show over here. And uh, we are going to do uh, live hosting and streaming from Groningen for the second show of New Dimensions in Brass. And um, we do a Dutch show. We will make a very nice show. Oh, we can't wait. It'll be terrific. Um, we've had a tough year all around the world, Yappy, with COVID. It would be great to see you in person again, my friend. Your hospitality is always first class. And as always, the first round is going to be on you. Yappy, thank you very <laughs> much for joining us. Thank you very much, Martin. Good night. My thanks to Yappy and best of luck with everybody involved at WMC 2022. Join us after the break as we return to Norway to chat with Eikanger's Vigo Bjorga, catch up with Eddie Gregson and make a trip to Queensbury to chat all things Black Dyke with Nicholas Childs. Join us again in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Band in Norway is not only one of the best bands in the world in terms of musical performance, but it also runs like a well-oiled machine behind the scenes, a huge factor in making today's bands a success or otherwise. We were delighted to catch up with Vigo Bjorga about what is involved in running Eikanger, but we started by asking him about his long history with the band and when his first association with this famous band started. Well, I joined the band uh, in August 1977, but of course I had been following the band because both my siblings were already playing there. And what got you involved with Eikanger in the first place? Well, of course, it's it's a kind of family thing, wasn't it, with my with my siblings there, and also a lot of friends, older friends played there. We were all in a school band together, and uh, I caught an interest in 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 the concept of bands. Um, I started playing the drums in the local school bands, and they needed a drummer. And so, when the conductor at the time, Tom Brevik, asked my mother if I could join the band, 
She said yes, and I was told that I had joined the band. So that's how it was done those days. <laughs> now, you mentioned Tom Brevik's name. Of course, Tom is now a legend in Norwegian mm. band in circles. How much of an influence was Evigo on your early career, and how much of a mentor is he still to you? Well, he had a massive influence on me and on all of us in my generation and, and the generations to come because he was uh, bringing something new into the banding, uh, local banding, uh, and he was ambitious and he was a good teacher, so he inspired us a lot. Wonderful. He was one of our adjudicators at the Band of the Year contest a couple of years ago. And mm. I have to say, he was an absolute gentleman. Now, you're still involved do. with the band, Vigo, very yeah. heavily now. Tell us what your role is now. Well, formally, I have the role as uh, one of two vice chairmen. Uh, we have a chairman of the board and two vice chairmen. Uh, one who is in charge of the running of the band, the daily running, which is me, and another one who is in charge of the musical matters, which is now our principal corner, Henning Arnensen. And the uh, the role I feel is also then the role of a band manager. So that's what I spend my spare time with. Okay. Now the uh, the business model, if you like, mm. of the Ikanga Bjorsvik band, it differs from so many bands here in the UK. It's a subscription model with members. Tell us a little bit more about that, please, Vigo. Yeah, and we are a um, um, fully registered membership uh, organization. So every every player, every committee member, we can be a democratic organization and then we qualify to membership in the Norwegian Band Federation and you qualify for funding from the state, etc. And how does that work? Is it one member, one vote, Vigo? Yes, in the band it is. Okay. Now, if I wanted to be a member of Ikanga Band, how much would that cost me each year? Well, for the membership fee and a kind of administration fee, you would have to pay every year a total of 130 euros approximately. Um, and then, of course, you have to pay, if we go to European, you have a, a part to pay there. And if we go on other tours, there may be some costs and there might be some um, extra here and there. But in general, we are quite low cost band. Most bands would have a budget each year of how much it costs to run their band for the year. Mm. Roughly, what is Ikanga's budget? Um, let me think. I think our budget for for this year uh, is about two. I have to be correct. Two hundred and fifty thousand euros. Okay. Uh, I think okay. approximately there. Yeah. So, how do you balance those books off, Vigo? <laughs> through concerts, through commercial income, through state support. What What is the split of that? If you compare us to the, let's say, top British bands, I think we will have to say that we, we don't earn much from concert fees uh, because most of the concerts we do of any substance, we organise them themselves and we lose yeah. money on them. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we, most of our funding comes from uh, grants and and the support from different uh, funding organization. And how much of the, the band's activity is involved in the local community and in engaging with the youth in the local area and around Bergen? We have a summer school every summer uh, where approximately between 25 and 30 bands are represented with their young players. Uh, not so many from each band, but uh, still. So we get involved with them. Uh, we expect our players to be available for to work at the summer school, if not every year, but during your career, quite a few times. We organize instrumental days, like the trombones, they have to organize one or two days a year for trombone players, etc. And we have um, a kind of a program called EBML, EBML Talent, which is for uh, ex an extended uh, tent piece, where we go a little bit further with super talents. Um, and we have a uh, now taking over a regional youth band and we do different things. We have a percussion ensemble and that is of course in addition to the days you spend with the band but it also does something with every player. It makes you feel whole <laughs> as a musician. Absolutely. It's, it's a wonderful ethic, uh, Vigo. Is this an ethic that, that, that you have instilled as band manager and chairman or was that already in place before you started? Well, no, it wasn't in place in that to that extent, but if we go back to just before I joined the band, and Tom Breivik joined as a conductor in 1973 already, and with the generation of that time who run the band, when they started this improving and putting up goals to be a better band and to be compared to English-style uh, brass bands, they were quite forward-looking because the um, already then the Eikanga band and the Manga band instantly took, started 
to work with the local school bands. If there weren't a local school band, they, they initiated it. See, you you quoted to me there, Vigo, that you wanted to be in the style of English brass bands. But I mm. think now the tide has turned. It should be the English brass bands who are looking across to Norway and Switzerland mm. as the model on how to run modern brass bands. It's interesting how the table turns, isn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and um, well, well, you can see it in any kind of business that, that there will be new ways of thinking. And, and of course, we are lucky in one way that we are not held back by any tradition. We, we mentioned earlier, very briefly, the Norwegian Music Federation. Mm. And this is a national body that covers not only brass bands, but every yeah. form of music. How influential and how important are they to Eikanger? They, they are extremely important because they organize all bands, as you say, um, mm. wind bands, brass bands, uh, school bands, adult bands, uh, ambitious bands, top bands, and also what we call coffee bands or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but they, of course, they, they, they own the competitions and they own some of the festivals and they run them very well. They are, it is important to have an organization which um, covers everything. Yeah, I, I think a lot of other countries who are listening to this Vigo will be very jealous of the Norwegian model. And you guys are really, really leading the way in that. So congratulations on su such a wonderful effort. Now, we recently heard as well, Vigo, that uh, Ikanga Band was the recipient of a very large funding donation reported as maybe one million kroner. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, that's correct. Um, actually, we've over the years got one million kroner, which is 100,000 euros um, each year from a um, uh, philanthropist, I guess you call it, um, yes. uh, called the Trond Moon. He's one of the richest persons in Norway. Um, and um, he has been, he has his aim to give away all his money before he uh, <laughs> continues in, into whatever comes next. Do you and, have his uh, telephone uh, number? <laughs> <laughs> I've got it, but I won't give it to you. <laughs> but uh, no, he, he is a, he's really, really big. He's get, given billions to, to science, to hospitals, and same to, to sports. He is concerned that um, you have to give something back to the community where you come from. Hmm. He's an open, clear um, a member of the Labour Party in Norway, uh, and he pays his tax with big, great pleasure. And, uh, and he, the fact he supports us um, is, can seem a little bit um, unnatural because he never actually supports the elite uh, because, if, 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 because they have this attitude that if you're only elite, you can fix it yourself. But if you're elite and you take a big responsibility, like we do, give back to, to next generations, he says that, of course, we should be funded because, of course, we need to spend a lot of money on quality music making. He's a good friend of the band now, and um, he's given us yeah, approximately 400,000 euros over the last year. So it's fantastic. Well, we've not seen each other in person for over a year. <laughs> uh, let's remedy that this year, Vigo. We, mm. we at Brass Pass are going to be over um, at Cities Brass in November. Yep again this year. Let's hope everything's back to normal for then. We can have a few beers at the bar afterwards, catch up on old times. And until then, our best wishes to you, Vigo, and everybody at the band. And thank you very much for your time in joining us today. Thank you and thank for the invitation. A lesson there in how to do things correctly in band management. My thanks to Vigo for his time. Come September, the Symphony Hall in Birmingham will hopefully be full to the rafters with a capacity audience enjoying the premiere of Edward Gregson's The World Rejoicing. It should have premiered last year, but with Covid cancellations, was moved to this year's contest as part of a multi-country collaboration on the commission. We enjoyed a very pleasant morning with Eddie at his Cheshire home to get an insight into the piece. So, Eddie, the last time we spoke, we'd just launched your work, The World Rejoicing, at the RNCM back in January of last year. And then the world stopped for this awful pandemic. How must that have felt to you, just launching the work and then everything's put on stop? 
Yes, I, I remember it well, Martin. Um, it, that was that was the end of January, um, and we all thought uh, everything was going to go as as it should have done. Yeah, it was very very disappointing. But then, when you consider what's happened in the world, um, I suppose you could say that a piece of music not being premiered was was really not very important uh, within the whole realm of, of what, what, what was happening. And it's been very, very difficult. It's been very difficult, of course, in our in our music profession for everybody. Mm. It's been difficult for professional orchestras, uh, opera, ballet companies. But in the world of brass bands, it's been really difficult because whilst professional musicians, as you know, have been allowed back to work over the last few months, Brass bands have not been like choirs, amateur choirs, not allowed to rehearse. So it's been very difficult. And now here we are, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of April, hopefully we will be seeing brass bands performing again to uh, to capacity audiences. And let's hope so. But the piece was um, a first in its kind because it was taken up by five different countries as their commissions for their own national championships. Yes, it was, and, and I have to thank Jappie Dijkstra um, from, from the Netherlands, a good friend of mine for many, many years. He had the idea, and this takes you back again, over, over two years, about, so about three or four years ago, when my 75th birthday was sort of on the horizon, and he thought what a wonderful idea it would be if we could have a, a new work, not just for the UK, obviously, or for the Netherlands, but for as many European countries as wanted to join the consortium. But there's never been anything quite like, like this before. And maybe it is, it is a, a template for the future. Uh, I mean, in the sense that if bands want to, to commission major composers to write works, as I hope they'll continue to do, you know, financially it's, it's an expensive business. And so a consortium of, of one, two, three or four countries getting together would make that possible. Historically, there were style differences between different mm. countries mm. who had a brass band uh, influence. Mm. The, the British style was very different to the Norwegian, mm. to the Japanese mm. style. This work brings a common link mm. between all of those styles and encompasses it in one fantastic 16-minute piece. Well, when I was thinking about what kind of piece um, to write, um, I was aware that the last two pieces I wrote for Brass Band, the two last two major pieces I wrote, were in 2012, or just before that, actually. And they, they couldn't be more different, those two pieces. Uh, it was the Symphony in Two Movements, yes. which, was, which was commissioned by the National Youth Bands of, of, of Great Britain and Wales, and actually the British Open, but that's another matter. Um, and then um, Of Distant Memories, which was written for the centenary um, of the uh, of the national championships in in the Royal Albert Hall, so they're two very different pieces because they they set out to do different things. For the national youth bands, I wanted to really test them musically as much as technically um, and intellectually as well. So the piece is the most perhaps the most abstract piece I've ever written for brass band, and so I was seeking out what would be the uh, a tune which which actually most European countries would know. And of course, this, this one, Nun Danket Alle Gott, which is now Thank We All Our God, written in 1638, a Lutheran chorale. This is, this is the hymn, you'll all know it. You see harmonies there, but you see, you see the point. Everybody knows that. Now, yes. thank we all like God. That, therefore, was the piece that I decided, OK, it's going to be based on that. Now, I don't want to age you, Eddie, <laughs> but connotations came mm. out 44 years ago. That's but it's still fresh mm. today. From a composer's point of view, how do you inject new ideas, new thoughts into an established medium which only has 25 set players. How do you keep the music refreshed? The first thing I would say is that as a composer, and, and I speak on behalf of all composers, none of us are static. None of us write the same music as we did when we were 20. Hopefully you evolve and you mature as a composer and your style and language changes. I don't write in the same, um, strictly speaking, the same kind of language as connotations now. 
nevertheless, there is, and this was for other people to, to talk about, not me, but there's obviously something called a Gregson blueprint, yes. which is part of connotations and is still part of this. I can't really tell you, Martin, what that is, because it's part of my kind of natural unconscious or rather subconscious uh, essential being as a composer. But like I've said, the world rejoicing is a different piece to the symphony and to um, distant memories. And that in itself, you know, they, they're about, um, um, what are they now, over eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, the, I suppose... I suppose it's also, I should say, although it goes back to the world of variations on Laudate Dominum, again, it uses different techniques. Mm -hmm. They're both variation pieces, but, but they essentially um, still use the same framework of having the chorale coming at the end. So, in fact, you, ne you don't hear the tune until the end. That's, that's the common link between variations on Laudate and this. I decided that it would use roughly the same kind of structure as variations on Laudate Dominum. So you hear at the beginning, on solo trombone, you hear the first element of the tune, which is... gives it a kind of coloristic thing so I can imagine on the day there's going to be a few very nervous <laughs> trombone <laughs> players because after that he then has on his own up to a top C piano so <laughs> that in itself is quite tricky but so you hear the first two elements of the first phrase before you hear anything else but that's all you hear so that's uh, that's actually the prelude just in terms of the structure martin um what we've got is um a structure which is a continuous structure a prelude which basically announces the first element of the tune uh, then you have a caprizio which is in a sense the first variation la danza one processional la danza two Arias and duets, which is the big slow movement, lasts about seven minutes in its own right. And then a fuga burlesque, burlesque fugue, a and then you hear the chorale and a postlude, which, which goes back to the, to the very beginning of the piece. So it's, it's a big sort of art-shaped structure with a prelude at the beginning, a postlude, which links those two things, and all of these variation movements uh, with different kind of elements musically in between. If you had to summarize what you would be looking for from a performance to for example a set of adjudicators mm. who'll be looking at this with fresh eyes mm. without any reference material to mm. previous performances yeah. or recordings or anything like that what would your summary to them be Eddie? well it's all i've always said about this it's all it's always about the music it's always about the music um there has to be of course a, a technical level that you reach uh, which 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 is obvious because you 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 can't you can't have a band making lots of technical errors and and sort of winning the competition. But in the end, when for me and I've adjudicated quite a lot, um, for me it's always the musical impact, the emotional impact that you get through the performance, and, and that in the end has to be the quality that comes through to anybody. Mm. And uh, also you have this collective response. You know, you've, yeah, I'm sure you've been many times in either a concert or, or in a competition, brass band competition, where you hear the performance, you know. And, and there's a kind of collective consciousness about it that everybody feels, mm. my goodness me, that, mm. was, that was special. If it happens to be the last work I write for brass band, then I'd be happy to call it my swan song because I'm quite proud of this piece. And uh, on a personal note, uh, of course, you know, at the time I was writing it, uh, my brother sadly died and i was very close to my brother mm. and it, and the piece is dedicated in memory yes. of him yes. so for me it's a very personal work and i hope that the nature of that emotionally comes through in the music and a very fitting tribute thank as you. well eddie it's been as i say a pleasure to spend time with you thank you very much it's a pleasure. and my best wishes for the future thank you very much our special thanks to eddie and his wife, Sue, who is the perfect host 
The lemon cake was absolutely delicious. The hymn, We Thank Thee All Our God, is the main anthem in the world rejoicing. And it is pure coincidence that it is the opening track of Black Dyke's chart-topping CD, Anthems, Hymns and Gloria for Brass Band. The CD hit the top of the classic FM chart last year and was a collaboration between the band, the Sheffield Philharmonia Chorus, conducted by Darius Batiwala, and all arranged by Luke Vertolman. The CD celebrates the work of John Rutter, who as well as celebrating his 75th birthday this year, has a huge following and is renowned for his seminal and religious-based music. We made the short trip down the road to Black Dyke HQ in Queensbury and asked musical director Nick Childs what it's like to have a number one CD. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to see us. Welcome to the home. Wonderful. Now, you have a friend with you here today. I do. I do. Uh, you were telling me off camera a little bit about the history, about how this fine beast came into your possession. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, during this pandemic, uh, some of the relatives or the uh, ancient uh, relatives of John Foster came to look at what it used to be. And of course, this is the band room, but it used to be John Foster's summer house. And um, they were quite impressed how it had all been developed since they last came. And they said they had a gift they'd like to send to us. So this came in, uh, in the form of a present to the band from the grandchildren of the famous John Foster who invented the Black Dag Band. And interesting, of course, you, can you imagine John Foster having his own band, thinking the first thing he's got to do is bring a professional connector, and the first thing the professional connector does is make it a brass band, which means that John Foster, who was a French horn player, had to be asked to leave the band. <laughs> well, we're here today to talk to you about your number one album that came out last year, um, the Anthems, Hymns and Gloria. Uh, what was it like as a brass band to have a number one album, not only on Classic FM, but also on Amazon and other sellers as well? It must be a very proud moment. It was a proud moment. It was, it was a little bit strange, wasn't it? Because you couldn't celebrate. Because it was, it was in, the, in the pandemic, in, in the, all these terrible challenging times for everyone. But we couldn't celebrate. So um, it was a bit of good news. It was a, a bit of good news. And so I was sending the news out to the, the band, and the band were telling me where they were. Um, it was nice because, of course, it was on Naxos, um, what a lot of people might not realise. Uh, the big salesman for Naxos within this country is Gareth, uh, used to play. Gareth Brindle, yes. And used to play first baritone at the band. So um, it's a nice connection to have. And uh, to see it initially, I think, going to the charts, I think he went in on number three the, the week before. And then he, he sent me a little note. He said, I'm sure it's going to go to number one. I thought, how does he know that? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he obviously knew that the sales were going to get so much better. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, really exciting. And as I said, a, a bit of sunlight at the time when we all needed cheering up. Absolutely. Now, it's an album that's a little bit different in concept. Uh, tell us how it all started, because it's a collaboration between the band, between Luke Vertolman, between Sheffield Philharmonia Chorus and Darius Batiwala, the wonderful organist with the Halle Orchestra as well. Tell us how all this various elements all mixed together. I've got to say, Luke was the, the man who was really had uh, the idea about this. And he was in October time and he invited me to a coffee. And uh, when I thought it was going to be a coffee, I thought it was going to be one of these ones that we meet at an airport. But no, he was the conductor at that time for the Carlton Main Frickley Band. And uh, he was staying in Sheffield, and he assumed that where I lived was next door. <laughs> of course, uh, it was a little bit more than that, but it wasn't a problem. I went to meet him, and I thought he would have one or two arrangements that he'd want to show me. Uh, but he, he asked me how much I knew about John Rutter, and I explained that I probably knew some of the Christmas music, but very little else. Um, I played uh, a little with the, the Gloria, and that was with John Price Jones and the Halifax Choral Society. But we only played one movement. And uh, anyway, he, he, he came along and he said he had some arrangements. When they arrived, there were 30. And, uh, and I've got to say, even the, what we've recorded now, we have in the bank um, probably five or six that we'd like to perhaps build on for the future. And I'm sure there will be another album that will be coming out sometime this year. 
you, you stole my next question because as soon as you said there's 30 arrangements, I thought there has to be a, a second album coming out. And is this still with the Sheffield Philharmonia or is all that a secret? No, it isn't. I, I think Sheffield are a, a special group, mm. uh, obviously led by Darius. Uh, Darius was uh, an organist. He was a pupil, a student of Philip Wilby's, and uh, one, a student that Philip is very proud of. Uh, he's a fantastic organist, of course, the official organist now for Leeds uh, City Council. That's right. um, his son uh, plays trombone in the Yorkshire Youth Band, so it's a, it's a nice connection. Um, but his, his talents as, when, as an organist, a companyist, and now as a conductor is invaluable. Uh, when we do our Christmas concerts uh, with Sheffield Philharmonic, um, they're such a good choir and they're easy to work with. Their enthusiasm is, is to be proud of. And so on this occasion, I was happy to hand over the baton uh, for Darius to look after Gloria. This sort of collaboration with choral societies and uh, philharmonia choruses, is this going to be a new direction for the band? If you think our first concert is going to be uh, at the end of June, at the, uh, and it's going to be with the Huddersfield Choral Society. And this is going to be in Huddersfield Town Hall. It's going to be on a cricket pitch. <laughs> yes. And if you imagine the band at this point, um, according to the regulations, we'll be two metres apart and there'll be 30 musicians. But in the choir, there'll be 120. But the enthusiasm for people to come back is still there because uh, even though it's on a cricket pitch that could normally accommodate perhaps thousands of people, there were 500 tickets uh, that were put out for sale and they're sold out. Mm. They're sold out. And so we've got fingers crossed that everybody behaves enough that we can move on to that. One of the things, Martin, of course, exactly as you're saying, is we've got to create that pathway of confidence where perhaps the people have got to get an idea of what they've been missing. And so um, we hope during the summer that Black Dyke will do some smaller concerts, but equally to encourage the local bands to come along and share the platform with us. One of them, we hope, is going to be in Halifax at Peace Hall, where Black Tide can perhaps do one section, and we'll invite someone like uh, Clifton and Cliff to come along and do the second half with us. Uh, hopefully people will listen to the music. We're not trying to gather big audiences, but make sure that let them hear what they've been missing. Absolutely. Of course, on the 3rd of July, we yeah. have our uh, Festival of Brass, which takes the place of the sadly postponed Band of the Year, which is now going to take place on the 30th of October. Black Dyke are going to be headlining at the Victoria Theatre in Halifax. And we hope by then that not only, I, I think we're safe to say that we're going to have a huge online audience yes. for that event, but I hope that we can get a huge in-house audience at the Victoria Palace as well. I think bands deserve that ovation. Certainly from Black Tide's point of view, we're looking forward to it. Uh, we're looking forward to it. You know, uh, I was a very big supporter of, of the actual competition. Um, I'm enjoying playing real music and, and knowing that the music that you're playing is actually pleasing so many people. Um, am I allowed to share a secret what our big piece is going to be? You, uh, Of course. <laughs> but yeah, John McCabe uh, is obviously one of the greatest uh, composers. And he has that talent, not just to write music that is powerful, but he's got it full of emotion. So when he starts off so quietly, mm. like Cloud Catcher mm. Fells does, yes. uh, then I'm sure it will create that sort of uh, image of performances that uh, Major Peter Parks, the real godfather of, of conductors, mm. really created here at Black Dyke. Yeah, well, all the bands who were competing, we asked them to play a piece which was famous with their glorious past. And Cloud Catcher Fells from Black Dyke, yeah. when they won, is probably one of the most iconic contest performances ever and goes down in folklore. It does. And I, th I think people will want to see the festival just to hear Black Dyke play Cloud Catch because of course since John's death I think it's three years ago now nobody's played it. Stunning composer um, I know exactly that when he was uh, first performed it was 28 years ago how do I know? It was this it was within a few days of when my daughter was born <laughs> and so it was it was that particular one so it was a, a special one and I remember you know listening to Black Dyke I think at that time Kevin Crockford was on, on soprano That's right. um, a real brilliant uh, performance and you know when the horn started off in such a hushed way special and for me um, uh, I remember it because of Rebecca of course but then later it was used in the All England Championships at that time the All 
Was it the International All England? The International All England Masters Championship. Right. Something else. And, and so I conducted then uh, the CWS um, uh, Glasgow Band, mm. and they won. Yes. They, they won. And so, um, uh, yeah, special place for, uh, for me as well. But I've got to say, uh, players in the band are, are jousting at the moment to who's going to be the soloist as well. <laughs> so that's work in progress. Well, that's good to hear because I'm sure, as always, Nick, Black Dyke are going to put on a stunning performance for us and we're very grateful for your support nick it's been an absolute pleasure as always to talk to you today best of luck with the band uh, for the rest of the year let's thank hope we're all back with live music and brass band playing in the very near future thank you very much for your time pleasure ah thanks to nick and his wooden friend it was great to meet up again as mentioned in our discussion Brass Pass are hosting a one-day brass festival on the 3rd of July at the Victoria Theatre in Halifax and it will feature not only Black Dyke but Brighouse and Rastrick, Carlton Main, Frickley, Fairy and Wingate's bands plus a set from the JSVB Legacy Band and a stunning solo recital from none other than Corey Principal Cornet, Tom Hutchinson. We can't wait. Each band will be playing a test piece from their glorious past as part of a 50-minute programme from each band. Black Dyke are going to give us an iconic performance of Cloudcatcher Fells, one of the test piece performances of all time. Brighouse are going to entertain us with Dances and Arias, one of my favourite Eddie Gregson pieces. Carlton Main are going to give us Sunset Rhapsody, Eric Ball's classic from the 1950s. Fairies, La Carnival Remain, and Wingate's with a rare performance of fireworks, Elgar Howard's iconic 1975 British Open test piece. Mouth-watering stuff from everybody, and we hope you can join us on that day. My thanks go to all our guests and our sponsors for today's show, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Our next show comes from Groningen in the Netherlands, so until then, stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye-bye for now.